Greetings, everyone. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and I wanted to thank you for joining another one of our online events. Our principal aim is to provide practical support to leaders of transition initiatives and those mulling over starting an initiative or doing other resilience building work within their communities. We want to continue to offer the webinars at no cost, but I always ask that you consider making a donation. We have a donation button on the top bar of our website. So thank you in advance to those of you who are able to do this. And without further ado, I want to introduce our fantastic presenter today, Starhawk. And Starhawk is one of the most respected voices in modern Earth-based spirituality. She's also well known as a global justice activist and organizer whose work and writings have inspired many to action. She is the author and co-author of more than 12 books, including her newest book, The Empowerment Manual, A Guide for Collaborative Groups, published in November 2011 from New Society Publishers. And if you don't have that one yet, I suggest picking it up soon. And as well as the many other things that Starhawk has been involved with, she also um, formed a film company with Donna Reed and uh, has made documentaries on women and the earth. And one of the films that has come out is called Signs of Our Time, about major discoveries in the goddess cultures of old Europe. And Starhawk and Donna's second documentary, Permaculture, The Growing Edge, came out in 2010, another great uh, film that I've seen that I recommend. And Starhawk is a veteran of progressive movements from anti-war to anti-nukes. She's the founder of Earth Activist Trainings, which are intensive seminars that combine permaculture design, political organizing, and Earth-based spirituality. And graduates now shepherd projects that range from community power down strategies in Iowa City to water catchment programs in Bolivia, inner city gardens in San Francisco, and women's programs in the West Bank of Palestine. So in all of this seminal work, Starhawk has become an expert in group process. And today with us, she'll dive into the following. Working groups, or working in groups of equals, is the heart of our work to change the world. We value community, yet groups are often very challenged and challenging places to be. How do we create groups and organizations that are warm, welcoming, that value and empower participants, that bring out the best in each of us? So in this teleconference today, we'll explore the personal sustainability that is the ground of effectiveness. We'll consider social permaculture, the principles and agreements that lead to healthy and functional groups, as well as the agreements we make with each other the way we make decisions, and how we handle the conflicts that inevitably arise. And just before turning it over to Starhawk, just wanted to mention that this call will be approximately 75 minutes. We'll have ample time for questions and answers. And periodically through the event, there will be some questions and polls that we'll do. So I wanted to turn it over to Starhawk now. And thank you so much, Starhawk, for joining us today. Hi, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to join you. And uh, hello, everybody. It's always uh, a little strange to do these things where I can't see you, but I trust that you're actually there. And um, I'm excited to dive into some of this material with all of you. Um, I'll just start by saying that a lot of this is based on the book I wrote that came out last year, which is called The Empowerment Manual, A Guide for Collaborative Groups. And I wrote that book because for 40 years or more, I've been working in groups uh, that have some vision of themselves as groups of equals, uh, as groups that don't have a formal top-down hierarchy, that don't have some authority laying down the rules and telling people what to do. And uh, I love those groups. I've had amazing, life-changing, transformative experiences in them. 
And I also know how incredibly challenging and frustrating they can be. And so I felt that um, looking, you know, that one of the things is to realize that a collaborative group, in some ways, is a kind of inherently different animal than a hierarchical group. And then if we understand uh, some of those differences, um, we can set up structures that will allow us to work together more effectively. And when we can do that, uh, then I think all of the amazing work that we're trying to do to change the world can be done more effectively as well. So... um, I'd love to just start with a little poll about all of you and ask, first of all, how many of you have been involved with transition groups of some sort? And And Carolyn, you can tell them what to do. I will do that, yes. Um, People who have been involved with transition groups, please press 1 on your keypad if you have a keypad. I know some of you probably have Skyped in. And if you've not, press 2 on your keypad. We can get a sense of who's on the call. And the numbers are coming in. Um, Predominance of people who are involved in transition initiatives or have been, uh, 57% are or have been involved and 21% not. And of those of you who have been involved, how many of you are currently involved? Again, press 1 on your keypad if you are and 2 if you're not. And we have 44% that are currently involved and 16 that are no longer involved. And so of those of you who are currently involved, um, this will be more of a one to five kind of poll, like one being our group is like barely functional, and five being our group is flourishing, thriving, growing. Where would you rate your group? So again, one one for barely functioning <laughs> and five for flourishing, and two, three, four in between. What we have is uh, 2% uh, barely functioning, Mm -hmm. 1% highly functioning or flourishing, and right in the middle at number 3 is 22%. Mm -hmm. Um, And then on either side, um, you know, number 2 and number 4 are um, 8%. So... Uh, it sounds like there's definitely room for some improvement. Uh, and I would, uh, maybe when we get to the question in the discussion period, I'd also love to hear from people who were involved and are no longer involved, sort of what were some of the factors in that. Um, but I want to lay out for you all some of the factors that I think make for healthy and thriving groups, Um, and to do that, there is a PDF I sent out called the Mandala of Healthy Groups, of Group Roles, and if you've got that, you might want to call it up and look at it as we talk. Uh, And Starhawk, um, for those that... Uh, we, we did send out an email, but some of you might have registered after that. Mm-hmm. And it's all on our website. If you go to um, the our home page and click on Heart and Mind Circle, uh, which is the event that you registered for, on that page now are those handouts. So you can download them now if you'd like. Great. So if you look at the handout, or if you don't have it for any reason, I'll describe it. You see a mandala, basically a simple mandala, a circle with a cross in the center, and the four directions. 
around the edge of it. And to me, I like to work with that framework a lot. It comes out of the earth-based spiritual traditions that I practice, and I think really it's a, a very, very common thing around the world uh, to think about the four elements as those basic things that sustain our lives, air, fire, water, earth, and to place them in the four directions. Not every tradition puts the same element in the same direction, uh, but that's because they come from the qualities of the land and the air and the rain and everything else where you are. Um, but this is the system that I use, and I like to use it because I think it's kind of an icon of wholeness that if you're looking at any question and you look at it from the perspective of the four elements and the fifth in the center, then you're going to kind of see all pieces of it. Um, At least you're more likely not to miss some major aspect of it. So uh, in this framework, the circle represents a circle of vision. And... I think a group's vision is what brings you together in the first place, um, the excitement that you have, the picture of the world that you have that you want to create. Uh, for me, I think one of the great attractions of the transition movement has been its encouragement to people to envision that world, to think about, you know, think about the future and backcast to how we get there. Uh, to imagine not just the terrible things that might happen, um, but the positive future that we can create uh, and the ways that we can face these challenges of lowering our carbon footprint and reducing you know, this transition to a low-carbon world you know, in a creative way. So that vision, in part, is that picture of the world. And then a vision also includes something like the mission of the group, what your group actually exists to do to bring that vision about. And uh, I'm sure Transition U.S. has a mission statement somewhere. Um, And I don't know if all of your transition groups or other groups have mission statements, you know, but... uh, a mission statement might be something like um, our mission is to help organize our community to use the resources we have now to prepare for a time when we reduce our use of carbon or reduce our use of fossil fuels. It's an action statement. It's about what we're going to do. And then a vision also often includes the specific goals that arise from that mission. Maybe the goals might be, I know in Totnes, they decided they were going to become the nut tree capital of Britain. So the goals might be, um, you know, to plant a chestnut tree on every block uh, or to plant 15 walnut trees in every park, whatever it is. You know, maybe your goal in your group Uh, is something very different. Maybe it's, you know, to address the uh, pollution of our major waterway or to uh, prevent the Keystone Pipeline from coming through our town, whatever that is. But those goals are uh, are aligned with your mission and your vision in a healthy group. Um, I think it's important for groups to take some time to really talk about their vision Uh, and to articulate those goals. Um, I've also seen groups that just foundered in trying to wordsmith their mission statement and never actually did anything. So (laughs) you want to be aware of taking too much time on doing that. But if you have a strong vision, you have a clear vision, it gives you something to go back to when conflict arises. And conflict arises in every group. Uh, Conflict is a kind of inherent state of our being as human beings. Um, It's not a bad thing. I think conflict arises uh, because we care about things. And when we care about something deeply, uh, we often have different ideas about it and different approaches to it. And that difference is part of our diversity. It's part of our strength. 
So if we can learn to do conflict well, uh, then we can, um, you know, we can use the energy. I mean, conflict is drama. If you're writing, I write novels as well and screenplays and things. If you're writing, you know, fiction or something, you've got to have conflict to keep people interested in it. And that's what grabs our attention. Uh, so uh, I think when our groups have a strong vision, then it gives you a place to go when you've got conflict. You can kind of come back and say, well, wait a minute. What's our original vision here? Can we come back to that? And that's often really, really helpful in moving through conflict in a productive way. So that's the circle. And then within the circle, if you look at those elements, um, they're in balance, hopefully, with um, different aspects of what arises in groups. So um, you've got north being earth, south being fire. And um, hmm, I'm looking at this and I see that, uh, is it? There's another mandala that's slightly different that I didn't send out, but I'll just talk about it. This framework. So, fire is energy, enthusiasm, um, power, and north is earth, uh, which is kind of manifestation, um, boundaries, responsibility. And I think in a healthy group, power and responsibility are in balance. That is, you gain power in the group by taking on responsibility, fulfilling it, by making a commitment to the group, um, by respecting the boundaries. And when you take on a responsibility, then the group empowers you, gives you the power you need and the authority, which is the license to use power, that you need to carry that responsibility out. And when you have power, that power also is kept in check by the group boundaries, the group values, the group vision, the group agreements. When those two things are in balance, that's what I call the axis of action, then the group can take action. It can move forward. When they're out of balance, uh, the group ends up um, having a lot of difficulty in accomplishing its goals. So there are many different ways that those things get out of balance. And I think one of the things about power is that power comes in many different flavors. Um, there's one kind of power that we're all familiar with, that's power over. You know, that's um, control, uh, that's one person or one group's ability to set parameters or to impose punishment or to hire you and fire you or to send you to jail if you misbehave. Uh, we all deal in systems that have that kind of power all of the time. And when we start a group like a transition group or many of the other groups, the spiritual groups or the activist groups or the permaculture groups, you know, or the groups of friends that we might be in, we often try to do away with that kind of power. Um, nobody has the power to hire you and fire you. Um, we're trying to work with different kinds of power. Um, so we don't have the same kinds of rules, accountability, um, as we do in a hierarchy. But the thing is that we often come in to these wonderful groups of equals with deeply formed expectations of how things are going to work that come from the way we've been formed by all of these systems of power over in our lives. So even though nobody has the power to set the rules or hire you and fire you, 
some level we may sort of expect that somewhere, you know, somewhere if there's a conflict, there's a mom or a dad who's going to step in and say, okay, you kids behave, stop fighting. (laughs) And then we get in a group where there is no one in that kind of role, and it can make conflict much harder to resolve. Um, Another kind of power is what I like to call power from within. And that's creative power, you know, the power we feel when we're writing or we're dancing or we're playing music. Or it can also be just the power you feel when you, you know, when you say something difficult to somebody. You know, when you take a step in a relationship that's hard to take or you speak an uncomfortable truth. And that kind of power we really want to foster in everybody in our groups. Um, And that kind of power often flourishes uh, when it's not being squelched by power over. There's also a third kind of power, and it took me a long time to see that this kind of power was operating in groups. Uh, It's what I call social power. Uh, it's not the same as power over exactly, although it can have some things in common. Um, and it's not exactly the same as power from within, uh, although power from within can sometimes help you get more of it. But it's really the power that you have in relationship to other people in the group. Uh, you could call it the amount of influence or the amount of rank, um, Arnold Mendel, the, who, the process psychology guy, calls it rank uh, or status or, um, yeah, or influence. It's the amount your voice is listened to compared to somebody else's. And that kind of power also comes in two flavors. You know, it can be earned or it can be unearned. When it's earned, you know, I think it's actually a positive thing in groups when it's earned fairly, when it's earned by taking on responsibilities, again, when it's earned by making positive contributions to the group, um, by helping the group move forward. In traditional societies, that kind of power is called eldership. Um, But when it's unearned, you know, it's what we call privilege. Uh, It's the kind of power someone has because you know, the color of their skin or because of the class they come from or um, because of some other factor that really they did nothing to earn but just sort of lucked out into being born with. And that kind of power I think we always want to try to do away with. So um, I think in groups we always have differentials of social power. I think that's just a factor of being human. Um, But again, what makes a group healthy is when we can consciously allow people to earn that social power and when we can be aware of the ways that privilege is operating uh, and when we can make sure that people come into a group They may not come in with equal social power, but we can try to create conditions that allow people to have equal opportunity to earn that social power. When we do that, and again, when that is earned by taking on responsibilities, by fulfilling it, by making real contributions to the group, then that all contributes to the group health. I've been in some groups that have so much of a value on being egalitarian that they really try to avoid letting anyone earn any social power or any perks of any kind. And I often find in those groups that tends to backfire, um, that oftentimes if people can't actually talk about social power, identify it, be clear about it, what tends to happen is that um, people end up, people with social power often gain it in ways that are not so healthy. Sometimes by having the loudest voices or being the biggest complainers or, you know, claiming the mantle of victimhood or in some other way. 
and that sometimes it can be really helpful just to have a clear discussion and clear um, agreements around both around social power and around the things that go with it, the kinds of perks and marks of respect and all of that that um, that get allocated according to social power. So that's the axis of action. I'll say one other thing, which is one thing that will really drive you nuts <laughs> is when in a group you are given a responsibility but not actually empowered to carry it out. Um, so I don't know how many of you... Here's another poll. How many of you have been involved with the Occupy movement over the last year? If you have been, maybe you can do the press yes or no thing again. Yeah, one, on your keypad, or if you have been, and two, if not. And while this is coming in, Starhawk, I just wanted to um, maybe give people a chance after this to see if there's any um, problems with sound or questions that need to be dealt sure. with. Um, at this point, 25, um, let's see, 35 percent have been involved and 30 percent not involved. Great. So I would say. Um, Some of you who have been involved, I don't know if you experience this, but I I always think of one meeting in San Francisco where the poor media collective person was practically in tears because they had a responsibility. They were supposed to write press releases when things happened and get them out to the press. But the problem was that things often happen in the middle of the night or at odd hours of the day, and they were also supposed to take their press release and bring it back to the General Assembly and have it approved by the whole General Assembly before they could send it out. And that was a crazy-making situation because the General Assembly only met at 4 o'clock every day. They couldn't possibly fulfill their responsibility and still... Um, you know, meet that requirement that every single other person involved or anyone who happened to walk in that day for the first time off the street had to have veto power over what they said. And um, so if you give someone a responsibility, you have to be willing to entrust them with the power that they need to carry it out. So that brings us to the next axis. But before we jump into that, do you want to ask uh, your questions about sound, Carolyn? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly see if anyone's having any specific problem. Maybe they came on late and don't know about the handouts or something. If there's anything that needs to be addressed right now, just press 1 on your keypad and we'll do that quickly. All clear? Oh, here's one person. Um, and that's Susan Livingston. Hi, Carolyn. Can you hear me? Yep. I was wondering if you could put a little bit more volume on Starhawk's mic. All right. Thank you for that. And we have another one, um, Colleen <coughs> Wagner. I'm just the same. I'm having difficulty hearing. The sound is kicking out every now and then. Okay. Thank you both. We'll um, do our best, and I'll raise the sound on her microphone. So back to you, Starhawk. Okay, and I'll uh, I'm trying to make sure I don't wander away from the receiver. So the other axis is kind of the east-west axis. Um, water, which is flow and emotion and creativity and trust, and air in the east, which is vision, um, communication, things of the mind, and things of accountability. And those two factors also need to be in balance in order to have a healthy functional group. Uh, you need to entrust people, as I was saying, with responsibility and with areas where they can have their own autonomy, their own creativity. 
if everybody in your transition group has to discuss every single aspect of what you're doing, you're never going to be able to do anything because life is too short. You know, right? You've got the newsletter committee and everyone has to discuss you know, exactly the font that you're going to put the newsletter into, um, you know, you, there's just nobody in the world has enough time to be involved in every single decision about every single thing that needs to be made. You've got to let the newsletter committee make their own decisions about how the newsletter is going to look, and you've got to let the media collective write the press releases. Now, in order to do that, you need to sometimes have a discussion and have clear communication. You know, you need to be able to say to the media committee, look, we've had a discussion now in the whole group, and here are the five talking points that we think are most important about Transition U.S. uh, that we want to be sure get included in our press releases. And here's the three things we want you never to say about Transition U.S. And then the media collective can take that and they can write their press releases and they can also come back and they can be accountable to the group. So if they start saying those three things you don't want them to say, the group can kind of take them to task and say, whoa, wait a minute, you know. Uh, we said we were never going to endorse a candidate as Transition Peoria, you know, so, right. Um, you know, so don't do that, and we can't do that. When those two things are in balance, when a group really works on its communication skills and learns effective ways of communicating and learns effective ways of giving constructive critique and feedback, um, then it can move forward not just into action, but also in the kind of learning that's always a balance to action. And as, you know, as human beings, we learn best, I think, through experience. We do something, and then we come back and reflect on it. And out of that reflection, we take lessons and learning that we can take into the next action. I also think our communication is better in quality when it's based on the idea of learning. When we're looking at something, if somebody has a critique, instead of taking it personally and going into a, how can I win this discussion, we're able to step back and say, what can I learn from this discussion? So that's the basic framework. And then on your chart, there's also um, four roles that are often useful to have people take in groups. These are not so much formal roles, though sometimes they can be, like leader, facilitator, but they're functions that need to be served in the group. Sometimes they might be served by one person or by many people. Um, But starting in the East, for air, you've got the crows. The crows are the ones who keep an overview. Uh, the ones who say, okay, we're having the big unleashing gathering. Um, you know, have we actually paid the deposit on the hall? Uh, have we actually sent out the calendar announcements? Did they get out in time? Uh, dis- is the person who ordering ordered the food actually um, bringing the food? You know, what's all the details that we've forgotten? Those people are enormously valuable to have in a group. And they are often the people that people perceive as leaders. Um, Traditionally, those responsibilities often go with leaders. Um, But I think they're only one aspect of leadership. It's a vital one, but it's not the only one. If we move to the south, then we've got the graces. Um, the graces are the ones with the enthusiasm, the energy, the ones who bring people in, the ones who run around telling all their neighbors, look, this great thing is happening, you've got to come. Uh, the ones who say, like, you know, let's have a party. <laughs> uh, the ones who notice when people are feeling left out and try to bring them in. 
And again, that's another aspect of leadership uh, that every group needs. And um, some some of that comes naturally to some people, um, but I think it's a quality that if we identify it, it's something we can nurture and we can try to foster uh, in all of us and also to really sometimes assign some people to say, okay, we're having a gathering in the park. We're going to have five people who volunteer to greet people as they come in or walk by and explain to them what's happening so that nobody has to feel lost or to be the greeter at our meeting and make sure that new people get filled in on what's going on. Uh, when a group has that, it really makes it more open, more friendly, more inviting, uh, and helps it to grow. Then we move along to the west, the water. We've got the snakes. Now the snakes are the ones who keep an underview. Uh, they're the ones who watch the emotional tone. Um, they're often the ones who bring up the things that other people don't want to look at. Um, Hello there. I want yeah. to see if... Uh, this is Caroline. I wanted to check to see if um, people have lost the call. Oh. Hello? Hello? Of Starhawk? Yeah. Okay. Did we lose the call for a few minutes or moments? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I don't know. I mean, I've been talking. Okay. Um, maybe it was just on mine. Let's see. I've got a couple of hands up. Um, Aeolia? Yes, this is Aeolia, and I never lost uh, anything. Starhawk was speaking, and then okay. you spoke up with your concern. Okay, um, and let me just check with Jennifer. Yeah, I'm here. And uh, did you lose the call, or no? No, I've I've been here the whole time. It's fascinating. Um, I've I'm delighted then, so um, I won't go to all of you, but I, I see some other hands up. So maybe some of us did, and I'm just trusting that we're all here together again. And uh, excuse me, Starhawk, go ahead. Okay. Right. Okay, so moving around to the north, um, we've got the dragons. Um, the dragons are the ones who hold the boundaries. Um, I came up with that. There was a collective household in San Francisco called Cauliflower. Years ago, I was interviewing them on something, and they said they always kept a dragon in the basement, uh, somebody who was grumpy and mean and um, would be the one who would come out, and when they had a visitor who would arrive to stay for one night and had ended up staying for a month lying on their couch, uh, not paying any money toward their food bill, eating up all the ice cream, the dragon was the one who would say, you've got to leave. <laughs> and they said every collective needs a good dragon to do that. Uh, so the dragons might be the ones who are aware at that gathering in the park that um, they're watching out for the safety of the kids near the pool. Uh, or they might be the ones who, um, when the drunk wanders in, uh, gently escort them out. Um, or the ones who might say, you know, when somebody is taking up too much of the group's resources, whoa, wait a minute, we've got to stop. Or the ones who might say when the group says, well, we're going to plant chestnut trees in every yard and fruit trees in every backyard and we're going to teach pruning and we're going to teach grafting and we're going to make our town entirely self-sufficient in you know, fruit trees. They might be the ones to step in and say, whoa, wait a minute. Do we actually have the time and energy to do all that? 
or do we need to scale back and uh, do something that we can actually succeed in accomplishing? So again, that's another function of leadership. Uh, it tends to make you perhaps less popular than the cheery, inviting graces. Um, but it's an important counterbalance. And so all of these are aspects, I think, of what makes a group healthy, functional, you know, what keeps the heart and soul and also the mind uh, in balance and allows a group to go forward. So that's been a lot. I'd love to open it up for questions now and see what people uh, might want to comment on or ask about. Starhawk, how did you want to do that? Did you just want people to press 1 on their keypad if they have a question or comment? Um, yeah, that would work. Okay. And I guess you will have to be the one to take them, right? Yeah, I'll let yeah. you know who's got their hand up. So, um, okay. yeah, questions or comments, press 1 on your keypad. And we have Alisa Beck. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. So I'm wondering if the dragon always has to be grumpy and mean <laughs> in order no. to hold the boundaries. <laughs> Thanks. It's a very good question. I think actually the dragon is probably more effective when they're not grumpy and mean, um, but can hold boundaries in ways that are uh, supportive and affirming to people, but nevertheless, um, you know, the, the way that I often do it as a facilitator, try to do it uh, when I'm facilitating a meeting, is never to say to people, you're wrong, you know, or you're off topic, or you're out of order, but rather to say something like, you know, that's a fascinating question, and I'd love to take it up, but right now we're focusing on this. Or, wow, I so wish we had more time to go into that, but we agreed, you know, that on 10 minutes, and now we're at our time limit. And I think when you do that, you meet a lot less resistance. Good, thanks. And we have Eva Monfell. Eva, did you want to go ahead? Mm -hmm. um, barely. Could you speak up a little bit? Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role of the snake, the uh, underview, and I was wondering if there was some overlap in that role and the role of the dragon. And I'll put my mute button back on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there is some overlap in that both of them, you know, tend to, uh, and then they, if they're not done very skillfully, they can make you highly unpopular. Because <laughs> the snake is often the one who will say, um, you know, whoa, somebody's gung-ho to do this, but I'm feeling that there's stuff that's not being spoken about it. Uh, or, you know, our very charismatic person here really wants to go ahead with this, but I'm sensing that there's opposition that we haven't heard yet. Uh, or, wow, you all think that was a wonderful, wonderful event that we just had, uh, but Susan ended up crying in the bathroom for three hours and nobody noticed. You know, and there's always a shadow side to everything that we do in groups and in as people and in relationships, and it's not always easy to be the one to point that out and to bring that up, but it's important for us. You know, we can easily get ourselves kind of entwined in a kind of group think. We're all like, yes, you know, pink oil is coming, and yes, the world is ending tomorrow, and yes, I've got to can my food or we're not going to survive, and pretty soon you've got yourself wound up into something that you all think is really vital, 
because you've all been talking to each other about it over and over and over again, but you forget that other people are kind of coming into this going like, what's this all about, you know, what's happening? So it's really useful to have somebody to kind of sometimes puncture the balloon. Um, Again, I think there are ways of doing it more skillfully than others. And part of that goes back to good communication and um, how to give constructive critique. Um, Constructive critique, I think, what differentiates it from just trashing people is when the intention is really to respect and improve the work or the relationship, and particularly when it's specific rather than general. You know, if you just if you say, well, that event that we just did for transition, it was awful. I hated it. That's not telling anybody something they can learn from. Um, but if you say, well, that event that we just did, um, you know, I felt like the speaker just didn't pay any attention to the criticisms that the audience was raising and just shut people down. That's something specific. That's something that we can look at and learn from and discuss and think about if we want to do differently some other time. Um, it's the same also with praise. You know, if you say, wow, that was the best event, w- you know, I've ever been at, that's great. And it's a lot easier to hear than, oh, that event was, you know, terrible. But it also doesn't really tell you anything. If you say, wow, I loved it because not only was that a dynamic speaker, but they really listened to everybody, that again tells us something that we can learn from and build on. Thank you, Starhawks. I wanted to um, turn it over now to Sandy Rowley, and we also have a few other people queuing up now. Okay. Um, so here's Sandy. Well, hi. Hi, Starhawks. Um, hi. Nice to see you again. Um, uh, my son Mike and I met you last weekend up in Oregon. Oh, um, yeah. Mike, yeah, uh, you sank my son's battleship. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, my question is along the same line as a snake and the dragon. In your book, um, they sold out before I could buy one. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, does it have how to, if you're a little bit of both, how to better communicate with people when you feel emotionally charged about something? Yeah, and it has. A- classes on the phone where we can maybe learn what mm-hmm. the stuff that's in the empowerment manual but instead of having to read it, which I'm having an issue with reading, where I can actually listen to it and apply it? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, I don't have an audio book for it yet, um, but I will say this. There's a lot in there about communication, and, um, you know, there's, some ground rules about communication that I think are really helpful when things are emotionally charged. And one of the frameworks I like a lot is Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication. There's a lot of people in different places that teach it and practice it. But I like his framework because um, you can remember it. It's easy enough to remember. It's not horribly complicated. And it's basically based on trying to empathize with other people's needs, even if you don't necessarily accept their conclusions. Uh, And to start by stating what your feelings are. So, you know, instead of saying, you know, you're such a slob, you left your dishes on the table again, how many times do I have to tell you not to do that? You know, if you're using nonviolent communication, you'd stop and you kind of say, okay, um, I'm upset. You know, when I wake up in the morning and come in and find the table full of dirty dishes, I feel frustrated and angry. 
And so part of it is actually identifying your own emotions. And emotions are generally some variation on something like happy, sad, angry, scared. Um, Oftentimes we think emotions are something like, you know, when I find your dishes on the table, I feel like you are just, you know, don't care at all about me. Well, that's actually not a feeling. That's a conclusion or an assumption. If we can step back from that and go back to the feeling and say, okay, I feel angry, I feel frustrated. Why? Because I have a need. You know, because I really need a clean kitchen to start my day. It just sets the day up for me. Um, And then you make a request. And a request, the difference between a request and a demand is a request something is something someone can say no to without paying a huge emotional price. So it might be, would you be willing to do your dishes at night? Um, and people are often more likely to respond positively to a request than to a demand. So if you say to me, would you be willing to do your dishes at night so that I can have a good morning, I'm more likely to agree to that and to try to do that than if you say to me, um, so if you don't do your dishes at night, I'm going to throw them at you tomorrow morning when I, you know, then I'm going to get my back up and go, well, you know, to hell with you then. So that's just one. There's a lot of different wonderful books and groups and techniques and stuff for teaching good communication techniques. Um, But I think that basically, coming back to knowing what your feelings are, um, putting out what your real needs are, and making requests rather than attempting to control the outcome. Um, We often attempt to take control of the situation and control the outcome before we open our mouth and say anything. So rather than saying, you know, it makes you vulnerable to share your feelings and to ask somebody for something. It feels a lot less vulnerable if you've already figured out how you're going to make sure that you get what you want. You know, if I already say, you know, so if I find the dishes on the table one more time, our marriage is over, you know, then I've already attempted to assert control um, but I've actually made my outcome much less likely for me to get. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Starhawk. We've got, um, that was really helpful. We have um, Jean Mackey next. Hi, Starhawk. Um, Hi. So, you know, I've been an activist since the 70s, and I have to say I'm a little discouraged right now because... Um, uh, I guess so many groups I've been part of, we've kind of done ourselves in <laughs> with the <laughs> unconscious stuff. And, you know, I've got as many shadows as anybody else, but I usually know, uh, you know, <laughs> if somebody points them out, I'm usually willing to look at it. And so when I deal with people who are obviously trying to heal something in the present that's mostly about the past, um, and they don't know that, I don't know what to do. And I don't know if you have any, if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, I mean, I um, I was trained as a psychotherapist around the time I started doing a whole lot of work as an activist and mm-hmm. in groups, um, and um, you know, and part of the reason why I wrote this book is because it's not easy to work in groups and it's not easy to try to work equally with other people. Other mm-hmm. people are extremely irritating and annoying. <laughs> <For> sure. <laughs> right. Um, but I've kind of come now to looking at more from from the perspective I've gained from permaculture and organic gardening. Ah. You know, and in permaculture, it's like 
you know, in conventional agriculture, you've got a, a garden and you've got a bug or something in it, you know, a pest, and you look at it and you go, okay, let's nuke it, kill it, get rid of mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, if, if gardeners were psychotherapists, you know, you look at the garden, you find a pest, and you go, well, let us find out, you know, what in the early childhood experience of this garden, what in its <laughs> very origins, you know, <laughs> Uh, led this pest to arise. Uh, but a permaculture looks at it and says, oh, we got a pest, that's information. Something is out of balance. Uh, somehow there are some conditions here that are favoring that pest. So how do we change the conditions so that we favor uh, the beneficial insects that we want you know, and not the ones that we don't want? That's great. And I think if we look at groups that way, um, that's why I kind of start with all this stuff about structure, is that oftentimes the pestiferous behaviors, right, which we're all prone to, um, you know, it's like if you have a group that sets no boundaries whatsoever, then you're going to have bad behavior. Right? Uh-huh. Uh, if you have a group that does not have some kind of accounting system for its money, then you're going to have arguments about who stole the money or who embezzled it or where it went or who lost it. Uh Um, Those are pretty simple things, but there are other structural things that... um, For example, if you look at the other PDF I sent out, that's also on the website. That's great, yeah. The one about communication took me years to realize this, and I'm still learning this, but you have a hierarchy, and uh, it's like that first diagram, the tree pattern, where, um, you know, you want to get a message and send it up or down the tree, you know, you start from a little point, and there's a kind of clear path for it to go on. And you know who reports to you and who you report to. But if you look at the collective or the collaborative group, it's like a web. It's like a network. It's like the Internet. There's like 10 different ways to get a message from point A to point B. And because of that, communication is a lot more complex. And because of that, it's often, um, you know, Oftentimes, a lot of the conflict in groups is around, I didn't get that message. I felt left out. Nobody told me I could be in this. You know, I didn't know this was happening. And many, many times, that's not deliberate. It's simply that people expect communication to follow the tree pattern line and don't realize that when you're working in a collaborative, you have to pay a lot more careful attention to the patterns of communication and to making sure that everybody who needs to be informed of something is actually informed of it. And it can often be very difficult to do because it can be very confusing about who's in a group and who's out of a group and uh, who needs to be informed and who doesn't need to be informed. But looking at that structure, you know, and looking at those conditions can tell you something about the behaviors that you're favoring and oftentimes shifting the structure or shifting the attention to the structure can help reduce the conflict or resolve it. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, And we have a number of questions still or people with their hands up, questions or comments. So here we go to Jude Asfar. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say to thank Starhawk for the simplicity, the sort of simple approach she's dealing, carding all of this out. And um, is there is there going to be access to? Is the, is the phone call recorded? Is there going to be more access to it? Or yes, um, it will be recorded, and uh, we put those up online a few days after the event. Super. Thank you. Arhak, do you have any comments about that? Um, no. That's, thanks. Okay. All right. Um, and we go to Laura Sullivan next. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm calling in from Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, 
I have a question. It may relate to the different directions and the two axes, but it especially relates to your discussion about social power. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I notice, I'm doing work with a lot of groups, uh, most recently the Memphis Bus Riders Union, which was formed out of uh, Occupy Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to bring up the issue also of economic power, mm -hmm. um, because I think uh, particularly in Memphis, uh, we have a a majority African American population, a majority poor population, and the folks that we're working with, we're we're doing things by consensus. We seem to be doing many of the things that you were talking about in terms of boundaries mm -hmm. and accountability and things like that. Uh, and we definitely have it set up so that transit dependent people are in the forefront and are empowered in terms of decision making. Um, what happens is a lot of folks don't have regular Internet access, mm -hmm. uh, often don't have regular phone. Uh, mm -hmm. Transportation is a huge issue, which just happens to be the issue we're working on. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had anything to say about how to, uh, even if you're conscious, then how do you put that into effect to empower people where there's such a, a wide differential uh, along socioeconomic lines in terms of power, in terms of resources, and, and in Memphis that also includes a very explicitly racial dimension. I think it's really uh, important that you're aware of that and working with that because oftentimes what happens in groups is if we're not aware of that, then um, you know groups function in two ways. They function by rules or agreements that are explicit, and then they function by norms that are kind of understood but not necessarily explicit. So you can have groups that will have norms that will consciously or unconsciously exclude other people, sometimes unintentionally. You know, if you're if the norm is that after every meeting you go out to the bar to talk it over and that's where all the real decisions are made, then mm. somebody who's a recovering alcoholic is going to be excluded. And um you know, when you've got those wide differences of socioeconomic groups and when you've got racial divisions, you're going to have a lot of different norms functioning. It can be helpful to talk about those things and, again, make them explicit. And it can also be helpful to talk about, okay, we've got different, different abilities to actually access the information and the tools of communication. So how can we try to equalize this? Maybe there's a way that we can pair up everybody who doesn't have Internet access with somebody who does who will be willing to call that person um, and inform them when there is an important meeting or an important decision. You know, um, maybe there's some way that we can spread access or maybe you know, maybe the public library is only open at certain hours when people who don't have their own computers can get in there. So maybe we need to take that into account when we decide on the timing of when we're sending things out. Or maybe we need to leave more time to inform people who don't have that. Um, but I think the main thing is to really be conscious of that and work with that. Um, and again, to, to name it, to identify it. Uh, and then it becomes um, then it becomes something you can actually make choices about. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Janice Lynn next. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hello, Starhawk Hi. and Carolyn. Hello. Um, uh, my question centers around actually using uh, the material from your book because I've um, asked my group to read the Access of Action, and I'm going mm -hmm. to ask them to start looking at um, t how to make agreements around decision making. Um, mm -hmm. The group has norms that are completely unspoken at this point. Mm -hmm. so. My strategy is to actually just have a discussion and then ask them if they feel comfortable with the ways they're making decisions at this point. And if they are comfortable, then to just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. But I thought I'd ask for your advice on that one because uh, I personally have felt 
uncomfortable about a lot of the ways that we've been making decisions, and I can speak out about that if I I feel like I'm going to ask each person in the group to mm. to verbalize where they're at with that. But do you have anything to add? Well, I would say having an effective decision-making process is really key to a group's survival. And um, one of the things that I sent out for you is the PDF, the Fivefold Path of Productive Meetings. Yes, I saw that, that today. Yeah, that was actually, it was supposed to be a chapter in the Empowerment Manual, but the book was so long and the chapter was so long that we had to sort of take it out. And so I put it up on my website as a free download, and I'm sending it out. Um, but it has a lot of material about decision-making and about choosing the right process. Um, I remember doing a, a workshop for one transition group in England, and he, somebody was saying, well, we have all these great ideas, but we don't do anything. And I said, well, what decision-making process are you using? And he said, well, we use open space technology. And I said, well, that would explain it, because open space technology is a wonderful process, but it's not a decision-making process. <laughs> you know, it's like trying to you know, use a saw to pound a nail. It's the wrong tool for the job. It's a great tool for getting people involved and excited, um, but it's not a great tool for choosing to do X or Y or Z. Um, so you need to have some kind of decision-making process, and people need to understand it, agree upon it, and uh, often need a certain amount of training in it. And I will say for those of you who've been involved in Occupy, I think one of the big challenges in the Occupy movement was that the movement supposedly worked by consensus, but I found, you know, and I was able to visit something like 10 different Occupies over the course of last fall and winter. Very few, if any, people had any actual training in consensus or understood what consensus is really about. Uh, so I saw a lot of the groups evolve what I think is like the worst possible decision-making process. That, you know, the best part of consensus, to my mind, is not unanimity, which really consensus is not about, or even having a super majority. Uh, the best part of consensus, when you're really doing it effectively, is that you hear everybody's ideas, you hear a whole range of opinions, you hear people's concerns, and out of that, you synthesize a proposal that best meets everybody's needs and concerns. Then you try to get agreement on it. What I saw happening a lot is people would come in with a proposal, they'd hear pros and cons, which you often do when you're voting, and then they would attempt to either get unanimous agreement or a supermajority without tweaking it and changing it and adjusting it the way you do with consensus. So they took the worst part of voting and the worst part of consensus and married them together and came up with a decision-making process where people could hardly ever agree on anything. And it wasn't surprising to me that a lot of groups had so much trouble with that. Um, you know, and so much difficulty often moving forward. In fact, I came to believe that you could take the best of consensus, which is that synthesizing, and then just take the best of voting, which is that simple ability to move forward quickly with a majority, and, you know, synthesize a proposal and then vote on it. It would have been much better than trying to take a proposal, hear pros and cons, and then get unanimous agreement on it. So looking at your decision-making process um, hopefully can help with that. And again, I, I send out to you all that whole PDF with um, a whole look at a variety of different processes. Thanks, Thank Sarah. You. Um, I wanted to call attention to the time, too. We have about six minutes left. <laughs> and um, we have a few more hands up. So uh, we'll go to Nick. Lanyer next. Hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I uh, I just first want to say, Starhawk, I'm a huge fan. But um, anyway, I um, am in a situation where I'm in a I'm in a theater group, <laughs> but the person, I guess, who you would say would be the dragon, who's actually the assistant director, mm-hmm. everybody ostracizes her. You know, mm. people people are mad at her. You know, nobody likes her. But she's just it's just because she's doing her job. So I was wondering if you have ever been in a situation where the dragon has been ostracized by the group, and if you have, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, yeah, I think that can often happen, you know, because, you know, it's a hard role to be the one to set boundaries. And um, I'll try to be really brief with this because I know our time is getting short, but I would say, you know, maybe bringing it up to the group and um, asking the group, you know, sort of naming what's going on and asking, hey, is this a role that the group feels needs to be done? You know, do we need someone to set boundaries? Do we need somebody you know, to actually help enforce our agreements? And if so, you know, is there some way that we can give effective feedback or whatever our dragon needs so that we can have this done in a way that we can all accept and all support? Um, Or sometimes there can be a way of saying, you know, if we can really agree that this needs to be done, uh, then maybe we need to share the role, so it's not always the same person having to take that role on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and we have uh, Soshan McMurchy. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, Starhawk, it's uh, Thanksgiving up here, and I give thanks for your words of wisdom. Um, I'm calling from Victoria, BC. We oh, have okay. a tried to go with a transition street here in our neighborhood and um, before it could gel as a group it just fell apart because of dissension Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, we're kind of licking our wounds. Uh, Do you have any thoughts about how to um, move ahead or beyond this? I know that's really vague, sorry. (laughs) Well, I know Diana Leaf Christian who wrote uh, some of the wonderful books on Intentional communities, creating a life together. She says 90% of intentional communities fail, mostly because of conflict and dissension. So at least you know you're not alone. Yeah. Um, But I would say that maybe looking back and trying to figure out, you know, look at that framework and see, you know, what was the cause of the dissension? Was there something structural that might have been put in place that could have helped the group to move forward. Um, often I find in groups when there's dissension or conflict that comes up again and again and again, you know, if you can kind of pull back from the personalities and say, what structure is lacking here? Um, you know, I've had many situations where people constantly bring stuff up on email lists and other people say, this is not the place for it. And then kind of have to pull back and go, well, wait a minute, maybe there is no place for it. How do we create a place for it? How do we create the structure that's needed? Uh, Sometimes that can help the group figure out at least how to do it a little bit differently next time. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. That's very useful. Um, Let's see. Starhawk, do you want to take another couple? Uh, Yeah. Um, Nessa? Um, yeah, thank you very much. This is really wonderful. Um, I, my question has already been answered, so I'll give the uh-huh. chance to somebody else. <laughs> Thanks okay. very much. Uh, we've got uh, Susan Livingston. I'm wondering, um, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm... I'm uh, I was uh, chuckling at your remarks about uh, Occupy and General Assembly. Um, I, as hard as I tried, I could never make it through an entire General Assembly. <laughs> right. I found it the most oppressive environment I couldn't get over. 
but I think part of it, um, if we could back up to mm-hmm. before we select a decision process, mm-hmm. if we can consider together what kinds of issues uh, should be subjected to that process and which not. In other words, the difference between when, when should I make an announcement and when should I make a proposal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know that's part of um, kind of training and experience with consensus or with any process is often recognizing, oh wait, when does this need a decision and when is this um, you know, if this is something my affinity group or my local group is going to do and we want to invite other people to do, we don't need the whole General Assembly to approve of it. Yay. We just need to let them know we're going to do it and invite them. Yeah. Um, but if this is something that, um, you know, is... Um, you know, an important thing that affects the whole group, you know, this, this is our plan for what we're going to do if the police come in and try to kick us out, then that is something we all need to discuss and have a decision about. Mm-hmm. I and guess that alone saves a lot of time and stress. I think there's a pet peeve going on here, mm-hmm. which is um, making proposals for what someone else is going to do. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right. Uh, or trying to block proposals for what somebody else wants. For what to I do. want to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's there's a book called The Skilled Facilitator um, by I can't remember the name, but I know he's in the bibliography and the empowerment manual, and he's got a wonderful thing about matching the decision making rule to the level of importance of the issue. Um, mm. So. You know, so that you know, if you if the issue is not terribly important, I mean, I have literally sat in a meeting where people spent 45 minutes trying to decide by consensus whether or not to take half an hour or 45 minutes for lunch, right? And and the discussion went on so long that it ate up the entire lunch. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of decision that you should make just by a simple vote. Mm-hmm. And I think skillful facilitators, even in consensus, will use a straw poll, which is a vote that's not called a vote, um, and just say, okay, most people want 45 minutes, let's go. Um, because if we spend another 10 minutes debating this, we will have used up all of our free time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, again, if it is something that everybody needs buy-in to, something that affects the values or the vision or the direction or the major resources of the group, then it's really worth spending the time on. Mm-hmm. I liked your example of uh, an, an affinity group planning an event and inviting others rather than yeah. proposing that the whole group do this event, underwrite mm-hmm. the event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I also noticed that um, you're, you're giving a head nod these days to sociocracy, but not much of one, and I wonder if you would comment on that. Um, yeah, I know a lot of people are interested in sociocracy, and, and I mean a lot of people who are using it, and it's something that I find interesting, but I haven't had a lot of direct personal experience with it, so uh, I don't really feel qualified to give it much more than a head nod. Um. Sarah Huck, thank you. I wanted to point out we're a little over time, and there's two more questions. Should we try to get through those um, quickly before closing? Or I'm willing to do them quickly. Okay, so we've got Karen and then Laura. Um, Karen, go ahead. Hi. Hey, Starhawk. I hope that you do more uh, teleseminars because I live in Brazil now and I miss you. It would be great to hear you more often. <laughs> um, my question is about um, the social... Um, Oh, I forget what it's called. Social power, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was in a situation where I was um, leading a group of uh, nine other women, and I had to prepare for it. It was a meeting that was going to have a change structure, and we were sent a new um, formula the day before, and I spent 
like seven hours going over it to follow it. And um, after the meeting, I was um, criticized for being chaotic and um, <laughs> um, actually for things that the others hadn't read the instructions and so they're criticizing things that actually had followed the instructions. And mm -hmm. part of the problem was there was some residue in the field because a few months earlier I had um, stepped down from facilitating a meeting I was supposed to facilitate. Someone else was really happy to step in, but there was still resentment in the field about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm left, I'm left with kind of trying to heal that up, um, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty complicated and even painful, you know, because people are supposed to be up under and supporting each other in this group, you know, mm -hmm. but what I didn't feel support because I actually I largely did a really good job and another very strong member um, was totally um, supporting me and happy with what I did and the leader, also the mentor, but there was three or four other women who were, um, you know, you know, who were, uh, they're having a little nice little group together complaining. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How annoying. Um, you know, sometimes, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I can be more specific without knowing all the details, which we probably don't have time for, but I would say sometimes you just have to kind of go, okay, do I believe I did a good job? Um, do the people I really respect believe that I did a good job? Um, in that case, I'm going to just have to let the rest of it go um, because if people already have an axe to grind, I'm probably not going to be able to persuade them or convince them that I did a good job. I can just let them do their thing and uh, move on, and next time, you know, or challenge them. Sometimes you can challenge you can challenge the complainers to actually take some responsibility for being part of the solution to a situation, and that often will uh, either get them to step up and do that, or get them to at least stop complaining. Thank you, Star. So good luck with that. <laughs> Uh, we've got our final question, Lara or Laura. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you so much for taking my phone call. Um, my question is, um, uh, we just instituted a, a basic consensus process in our meetings, mm -hmm. and we aren't exactly sure what modified consensus is, but what, but what question came up last night was, um, if a person misses a meeting, we have about six people in our meeting, six or seven people. Do you recommend giving people who missed a meeting um, to have a say on the proposal if the rest of the group reached consensus? Um, I would say it depends. Uh, in general, I would, you know, I'd say it's really disempowering to a group to have to constantly go back and revisit a consensus because someone wasn't there. But if it's a key issue that affects the entire group, um, you know, then I think it's really wise to have, like one group I know, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, that's an intentional community. What they do is they have items come up for presentation at one meeting and then for discussion at the next and then for decision at a third meeting. And when you have the time to do that uh, and when you can alert people that something's going to come up at a certain meeting, um, then you know people can know, oh, if I really care about that, I've got to be at that meeting, or I've got to at least make sure someone conveys my concern about it. Um, oh, okay, that's great. So then, if, yeah. if they if they've heard the discussion, mm -hmm. and then um, they know that there's a meeting where the decision is going to happen, if that person happens to miss the, the meeting, then they know ahead of time that, that they're not, their role won't be included. Right, yeah. But if they don't know ahead of time and something just comes up, you know, that's really important and vital, you know, to everybody or maybe to that one person, 
you know, if I'm not at the meeting and the group suddenly decides that uh, the role I've been filling in the group should be eliminated, <laughs> then that's <laughs> obviously not too cool. Right. Um, and would you call that modified consensus? Uh, it, I would call, there's different ways to modify consensus. You know, one way is to have uh, basically a supermajority fallback to a vote of certain number. One way is to say you can have a consensus minus one, uh, which often comes to, into play if you have to vote somebody out of the group. Uh, one way is to say uh, everyone can be part of the discussion, but you can only block consensus if you uh, either are you know, an actual member of the group or fulfill certain criteria the group sets, or sometimes a group will say, well, an affinity group or a working group has to reach consensus to block a consensus. An individual alone can't. Uh, there are many ways of modifying consensus. Uh, or you could try, you know, the we do our best to reach the synthesis in our discussion, and then we put it to a majority vote. Um, there's a lot of different ways to work with it. And one of the things about decision making is, you know, that none of these processes are like set in stone and, you know, received from the holy tablets. They're, they're things that we can experiment with and we can develop and make work for us. Thank you, Starhawk, for, mm -hmm. for um, doing some extra questions and staying with us um, a little longer. Totally appreciate that. And I wanted just to give you an opportunity to do um, a closing comment, and then I'll just mention a few of our upcoming webinars. Great. Um, I'll just say really want to appreciate all the wonderful work that people are doing and the ways that we struggle with all this stuff and continue to learn and grow. And um, to let people know that if you want more information, you can go to my website, which is starhawk.org. Um, I have a schedule page on there, and I will be doing some in-person stuff this year on these issues um, that people are invited to come to and attend. And... Um, yeah, and uh, working on a number of exciting projects. And, and Starhawk, would it be um, of value to you if um, some of the transition groups would like to host you in coming and talking with them? Really? Yes, if people are interested in doing that, Great. Uh, they can, the best way is to send an email to MER, M-E-R, at starhawk.org. Right. And uh, she is the person who handles all my scheduling. Uh, and um, be great. I love coming and talking and working with people around all of this. Yeah, and I know a lot of groups uh, need this kind of help. So thank you for bringing such expertise to this and just really appreciate you, Starhawk, and all oh, you've thank given. You given to the transition work um, to date. You've helped us a lot over the, the few years we've, we've been doing this work. So um, look forward to having you on another time as well. Um, you've got just such valuable things to share, and I know we just touched the tip of the iceberg.